So one thing that I think is important, the easiest way for us to provide the transcript levels to you is through an Excel spreadsheet, believe it or not. So this is actually in the Nature paper, and if you go onto the Nature site, you can just download supplemental table A and B. And what this is is um, the expression levels. And this example here is from the RH tissue, and all this is is a list of the genes that are expressed against each one of the libraries. And then here's the putative function. So you can download this for, this one's the DM, and then there's also RH as well. So you could download this, just have it on your desktop. If you're interested in a gene, you can pull this up and quickly look at its expression across all the different tissues. The only issue is these things are very large files, like 30 megabytes. It takes a long time for it to actually download. Um, but I think these are very helpful for you to get an idea of expression. Now, the units for this RNA-seq data, they're, they're normalized for the length of the, the transcript and also for the number of reads you got per lane. So it's in what's called FPKM, which are fragments per kilobase per exon model per million map reads. So just think of this as a normalized value that you can go up, down a library across many genes and also between libraries. So the SOLCAP site uh, also has some data that's accessible. And what we have is, is some intraviral SNPs we detected in the Sanger population, but these aren't nearly as rich as our Infinium um, data. But we provide for download the 69,000 information as well as the 8,300 SNPs that are on the uh, Infinium array. So you can just go to the SOLCAP website, and um, if you click on this link right here, this is the 8,300 SNP mapping information and the context sequence. So essentially you get the SNP, which super scaffold it's on, what position, and then here's the sequence. And you can do the same thing for the 69,000 SNPs. So if you're interested in any candidate SNPs for your own work, you can just download that. That's freely available. So just some acknowledgments, the consortium um, was a huge international team that were working together for the uh, generating the potato genome sequence. I think the only other member here is um, Richard Falou, is the, the other member that's um, here at the meeting. And then on SOLCAP, which Dave will be telling you a little bit more about, it's obviously a very large collaboration as well. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes, Richard. So, so just so everybody could hear the question is, if on the wiggle tracks for the different tissues you saw difference in intensity across the exons, most likely that means that there's alternative splicing and maybe that splice form is under or overrepresented compared to the other ones. So the first thing I think I would do is you look at the representative model versus the isoforms and take a look to see if, if an uh, isoform is being predicted that has a skipped or a retained exon and take a look at that, and then you could come back and make an interpretation. But I think there, if you're really specifically interested in it, you would need to remap the reads, and you'd have to do it a little bit differently, because we mapped against just the representative um, isoform. Okay. Yeah? Um, when you compared the three genomes came up with one that we did with one mm -hmm. No, so in the coding region, it's much more conserved. The intergenic region is quite diverse. So yes, it's different, it's different depending on, on um, which part of the genome you're actually looking at, yes. No, but I think, I mean, let me look at this one slide. I actually think that these numbers here are for just the coding sequence. I think I have to go check that part. But the problem was is in the intergenic region, you would just have missing sequence. That's the problem. There's, they're so diverged that there would just be like 25 kb that was just totally missing, right, in the two haplotypes. So that's, that's the issue. So I'm thinking that this would only be where they actually aligned well, which would typically only be the coding sequence. 
because if they didn't align very well, you can't include them. And if you notice, if you look, see, so, so we actually had a lot more sequence for RH, but it didn't align very well, so you can't quite get those numbers. So I have to look, but I think these might just be coding sequences. I'll have to check. Maybe, maybe including the introns, but I'll have to check. Yes, Dave. Okay, so for the remote people, this is the slide that's titled Generating High Confidence SNPs. And so after you do the filtering just on sequence quality and coverage, you're left with uh, about 81,000 SNPs. But to make a, an infinium SNP, it needs to be biallelic. You don't want that to be anywhere near the intron, right? And you also can't have too many SNPs in that 50 base pair window. So that's where we went from 80,000 down to 69,000, okay? And that's just design criteria. So the 80, 81,000 are actually high confidence SNPs as well, but they may have too many SNPs next to the one SNP you'd want to measure. And so you can't design um, an assay properly against those. Right, so, so, so here going from the 575,000, which are filtered. So, so there's several filtering that's going on. First you start with over 2 million SNPs and you filter first for read depth, density, and quality. Um, but then what you, we had to do, this was from all three accessions, then we aligned them against the genome to make sure we weren't, you know, miscalling things. So this is, this is the, the total amount of SNPs, and then this is the unique number of SNPs. So there's plenty of SNPs, so you could do this for any accession. You just want to filter, 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 because you're going to have so many anyway. Yes. Yeah, so, so the question was, is the orientation of the super scaffolds and if, when is that going to be updated and when, when would we know? So there is a new version of the pseudomolecules that will be coming out, I don't, um, I don't know, in a few months. Um, but Dave will actually show you data that, at least in terms of it being on a linkage group, it's, 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 it's very, very, very correct. So that's not an issue. And I don't know when the new pseudomolecules come out that they can really, I don't know that they added a lot more markers, because that's the only way you can get the orientation, right, is if you have at least two markers and you actually detect a recombination event. But in terms of them being in the correct order, Dave will show you data from two diploid maps that they're highly accurate. I think there's only... 200 SNPs that aren't on the right linkage group, right? So I think, I think the pseudomolecules are actually quite, quite good in that aspect. The orientation's only going to be resolved as soon as we get more markers to put on there. And so that Dave can tell you about, so we, we've, we've added more markers now um, from, from the Infinium chip in terms of where they're at, okay? But I think, I think if you do have issues, you should at least maybe let me know and the people that are making the pseudomolecules and we can correct it. But they've sort of poured over them, I think, in, in detail using as much data as they have in hand right now. Thank you.